10 years ago, the last double-chip NVIDIA graphics cards were released. And with the release of the RTX 4000 series, NVIDIA also decided to abandon the technology called SLI. But AMD did not. The company is preparing to launch the RX 8000 lineup, in which several models supposedly will have a dozen silicon chips on one board at once. But why? Why has multi-GPU technology become interesting again? And what does chiplets have to do with it? This is MK. Today we'll talk about the future of fast video cards. The technology for combining several video cards is not much younger than the video cards proper. In 1998, the now defunct 3DFX company offered users additional FPS from connecting two GPUs called Voodoo 2 at once, calling this feature Scanline Interleave, or SLI for short. But ordinary gamers did not appreciate this approach, as it was way too expensive. You also needed a 2D video card, and all of it had to be interconnected with a cable. The resulting build turned out to be unnecessarily complicated, expensive, and to be honest, useless. Not all games could enjoy a tangible boost from doubling the GPUs, and the bottleneck was in the processor anyway. Other video card manufacturers observed the ventures of 3D effects with interest, but did not interfere until the year 2000, when the company broke down in attempts to launch a monster with as many as four video chips on one board. NVIDIA successfully absorbed its former competitor along with all the technologies, and SLI was forgotten about for several years. The year 2004 is coming. A new interface called PCI Express is entering the market, which is of course used in the new lineup of NVIDIA cards, the GT6000. In order to gain more foothold at the top of the graphics card market, the green company is reinventing SLI. Now this abbreviation stands for Scalable Link Interface, but in fact it is still the same SLI from 3DFX. Take two cards, connect them with a bridge, and here you have a two-fold increase in frame rate in games. In theory, that is. We'll talk about practice later. In 2005, the then ATI also decided to try out multi-GPU with a similar technology called Crossfire. The principles laid down by 3DFX back in the 90s turned out to be so convenient and simple that nothing changed for almost 10 years. I mean, formally, Crossfire and SLI did get new versions, but they were mainly aimed at increasing the bandwidth of the interface connecting the cards, as well as adding more complex ways of combining cards, for example, the ability to connect three or even four video cards at once. In the case of NVIDIA, one video chip could be busy working with physics, which unloaded the second chip, and AMD's hybrid Crossfire allowed integrated and discrete graphics to be combined together in laptops, which made it possible to slightly increase the frame rate. In addition, both companies often made their top-tier GPUs double-chip, two GPUs on the same board, that is. As a result, we had such abominations as the GeForce 7950G X2 with two boards, or the Radeon R9 390X2 with a TDP of as much as 580 watts which is too much even for the RTX 1490. But still, the multi-GPU technology did not become popular, despite the fact that SLI and Crossfire support appeared even on the simplest GTX 660 level cards. This technology had a lot of problems, and the most obvious one was optimization on the part of game devs. If one video card would work in any game, then two or more only if the developers create a special profile for SLI or Crossfire. Without it, a two-chip GTX 690 priced as much as $1,000 would turn into a regular GTX 680, which was half the price. And there were quite a lot of games without multi-GPU support, which made getting a two-headed card or using SLI expensive and quite useless for the most part. But there were situations when the owner of a GTX 960, which was already struggling with running new games, thought about buying a second such card at a low price and combining them via SLI. On the surface, it seemed to be a good solution, but in reality, it was not that easy. Firstly, not all chipsets support SLI, and if at one time you saved a buck on your motherboard, which, taking into account the GTX 960 and a Core i3 processor or something cheap like that, would make a lot of sense, then connecting a second card would be impossible. But even if your chipset is suitable, there should be a second full-fledged physical PCIe X16 slot on the board which, again, inexpensive M80X boards wouldn't have. Also, there were some software issues. For example, one of the ways SLI works is alternate frame rendering, or AFR. 
even frames are prepared by one GPU and odd ones are prepared by the second. Since in this mode the cards were not really dependent on each other, Nvidia promised a maximum performance gain of as much as 90%, but they were silent about the fact that it would cause bad stutters at low frame rates, since neighboring frames could differ in complexity and therefore processing time. But such a problem did not exist when rendering one frame simultaneously by two GPUs, using the split frame rendering method or SFR. In this case, the frame was divided into two parts so that the complexity of the geometry in them was comparable. This removed the stutter issue, but added another issue. The increase in performance from using two cards was greatly reduced, up to a ridiculous 30 or even 20%. There was also high requirements for the power supply unit and cooling inside the case, since one card was always heated more than the other. On top of that, in some non-optimized games, turning on multi-GPU would even decrease the frame rate in comparison with a single GPU. Therefore, it is not surprising that in recent years Nvidia has been gradually curtailing support for this technology. If in 2014 even the GTX 950 had a support for SLI, then in 2016 only the GTX 1070 and higher. In the Turing generation, multi-GPU can only be run on four cards, the 2070S, 2080, 2080S, and 2080Ti. While in the Ampere lineup, only two top-end cards, the RTX 3090 and 3090Ti, support NVLink, which is what SLI is called now. With the release of the RTX 4000, NVLink was done for. Even the RTX 4090 doesn't have it anymore. And it would seem that this is it. The story of SLI and Crossfire is over. But suddenly, in the RX 7000 lineup, AMD turned back to the chiplet technology long abandoned in video cards, which is when there are several dies on one substrate. In the case of the top and Navy 31 GPU, which is used in the RX 7900 XT and XTX, seven dies are used, one video chip and six cache memory chips. Team Red is not going to stop at it. And schematic images of the company's next top end GPU called Navy 4C are already circulating around the web. Which is interesting because it's rumored to have a couple of dozen chiplets, and in fact, the company is returning to the idea of multi GPU. There will be a separate die responsible for multimedia functions and for combining other chiplets, and up to nine SEDs or shader engine dies, which are in fact video chips that will be responsible for graphics. Perhaps there will be several other types of chiplets, for example, cache memory. In short, AMD is clearly planning to reinvent multi-GPU with significant improvements. Instead of separate widely spaced chips connected by a rather slow and long crossfire bus, the company will place several video chiplets or SEDs on one substrate, linking them via Fast Active Interposer, or AID. According to rumors, there will be no top-end GPUs in the RX 8000 lineup, Perhaps the Navy 4C chip turned out to be so hard to produce that we will see an advanced video chip structure only in the RX 9000. But one important question still remains. Why does AMD seek to go into chiplets at all, while Nvidia continues to use monolithic dies? If you follow the evolution of video chips, it is clearly noticeable that GPUs are constantly getting bigger and bigger. In the GTX lineup, the die area seldom exceeded 500 square millimeters, but in the RTX, despite the finer process node, you can see huge silicon dies with an area of 600 and even 700 square millimeters. And the further we go, the bigger they will get. Reducing nanometers isn't happening as quickly anymore, and the increase in performance of top end GPUs is still happening by brute force, which is by increasing the transistor count. As a result, chip makers are beginning to face serious difficulties. The larger the chip, the statistically higher the chance that it will be defective. Plus, the silicon wafers from which the GPU is cut have not changed in size for more than 10 years and have a diameter of strictly 300 mm. And the larger the video chip, the fewer of them can be cut out of one wafer, and the more expensive each die will get. So the production of huge semiconductor chips is expensive which of course greatly affects the price of video cards. This is one of the reasons why NVIDIA RTX 2000 series turned out to be significantly more expensive than the GTX 1000. The transition to chiplets is the way out of the situation. Why produce one huge and expensive chip that can do it all if you can make a lot of small ones and combine them together? Two birds with one stone. Got a defect? Discard only the inexpensive die and not the entire GPU chip. In addition, more chips will fit in one wafer, which means that the production cost per chip will be lower. 
AMD has been using this approach for several years in its Ryzen CPUs, which have one or two chiplets with cores and one I.O. die, and another one with integrated graphics. And practice has shown that the company can really sell such solutions cheaper than Intel's monolithic counterparts, and this allowed Team Red to win people's love. It is not surprising that AMD decided to apply this technology to video cards as well. The use of separate chips for cache, multimedia, and computing is likely to cost less than the development and production of one large chip. Perhaps not immediately, since it's still a huge task to develop the interconnection, but the company's engineers definitely see this as a prospect. In addition, the use of chiplets significantly simplifies the scaling of GPU lineup. Now, NVIDIA has to develop a separate video chip for almost every tier of their video cards, as well as for every lineup. For example, the RTX 1490 comes with AD102, the 4080 has AD103, the 4070 and 4070 Ti have AD104. Yes, they differ from each other only in the number of compute units and memory controllers, but still, the production of each of them requires a separate production line and additional debugging, which of course is expensive. Chiplets eliminate this problem completely. The production of just a couple of types of dies will cover for the entire lineup of video cards from low to top tier. Want a fast RX 8900 XT? Here's a dozen shader chiplets and the same number of cache memory chiplets. Need a simple RX 8400? Just put fewer of those chiplets in it. Of course, there's also the bus that has to be scaled, but the company has already tested out this technology on their CPUs. And most importantly, such chiplet multi-GPUs will most likely have no problems with software like SLI or Crossfire do. The integration of compute dice with a high probability will occur at the GPU firmware level, that is, below the system or driver level. Therefore, in all applications, such chiplet video cards will be displayed and will work the same way as monolithic do, and will not require any workarounds and fine-tuning on the part of software developers. The development of technology is always fun to watch. In the case of processors, multi-core has taken root, and single-core CPUs have long been a thing of the past. In video cards, on the contrary, a couple of GPUs in one PC have always been a thing for geeks. But history is cyclic, and difficulties with the development of finer process nodes again unite two branches of development into one. And while we are already used to chiplets in CPUs, in GPUs, AMD is only taking the first steps. The silicon limit is getting closer, and it is quite possible that in a couple of generations, chiplet GPUs will completely replace monolithic ones, starting a new era of development of graphics technologies. If you liked the video, let us know about it. This is important not only to us, but also to the YouTube algorithms. My name is Mikhail Krashen. I'll see you again. Bye.